Hi, I'm Scott Edingham. Thanks for joining us here in the unique Northwest. Colleges and universities all around the country are coming back to session, and many are dealing with how to handle COVID-19 cases on campus. One of those campuses, of course, is Washington State University, which is dealing with a big blow up of cases in Pullman as of late. And joining us to talk about it is WSU President Kirk Scholes. Thanks for joining us today, President Scholes. Scott, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity and, and look forward to our conversation. Indeed, and we should say at the top that this public broadcasting station is licensed to Washington State University and the Murrow College, but we are editorially independent, including for this program. So that said, like I, like I said, President Scholes, the big cases blowing up in Pullman, we've seen those uh, daily, uh, that case count rising. How concerned are you uh, as an institution and the president of that institution and what is WSU really doing to address it? Yeah, um, we, I mean, we are really concerned. Uh, obviously, when we see those cases continue to, to go up every day, uh, you know, we're worried right now, most of the huge majority of the cases are within, shall we say, a student population uh, living off campus. And it hasn't really spread much from the student population uh, into the community. But we're concerned about that. We're monitoring that. We're working with public health officials on this, and um, we're ramping up our testing. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we've spent a lot of time on over the last couple of weeks. So Cougar Health Services uh, has got their testing set up and operational, and uh, we brought in a mobile unit from the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine that's right in Greek Row uh, today. Uh, they're doing testing as we speak. Uh, just to make it easy for people to come and get tested. And then we're also working with the Army National Guard. They're going to be here for a period of time, set up in areas with high student concentrations across the community uh, to also assist us with collection of test results and things like that. So we're going to ramp up our opportunities for uh, students to be tested. Uh, and, and so what's going to happen is we're going to see counts continue to increase because you're going to increase tests and just the raw number of tests is gonna go up and those are gonna increase, but that allows us to track a little bit more about what's happening in the community, uh, where it's going and things like this. Um, I know there are people who uh, feel we've been unprepared. How come we weren't ready for this? Uh, I would point out a couple of things. One, every college town in the country has seen this same sort of spike um, and whether they were in person or not. And uh, University of Alabama, uh, in Tuscaloosa, uh, had over a thousand cases their first week. So uh, this is not unique to Pullman. Uh, and uh, so it's something that we've seen as an issue in many, many places around the country. Uh, second, uh, we're working on increasing our communications to our students um, through creative uh, types of social media postings, uh, the Cougs Cancel uh, COVID campaign that's around town, uh, text messages and alert systems that we're using on weekends to remind everybody to abide by the social gatherings. The Pullman police locally citing people when there's more than 10 people together and they're not wearing masks and abiding by Governor Inslee's mandate. So um, it's an evolving situation and I wish there was a playbook that I could go to and look on page 35 and it tells you to do these same things, but we're all struggling a little bit with it. But uh, I am concerned, our community's concerned, our leadership team is concerned, and uh, we're acting by increasing testing, increase our messaging, and working closely with our community uh, to make sure that uh, we keep this as under control as we can. Let's back up just a little bit because uh, you mentioned the, all, a lot of other college towns are dealing with the same thing. The New York Times has an analysis of, of various places around the country where the outbreak is growing the fastest in Pullman, Washington, I might note. Uh, little old Pullman uh, ranked uh, highly on that list uh, recently right. in the top 10, and in fact, in the top five. And the other towns on that list are largely college towns as well. So what I want to ask, though, uh, is about the decision to go to online. Online. I was sure we didn't mention that yet. WSU is in an all online model, yet there are still thousands of students in the city of Pullman for this fall semester. Can you back up a little bit to the decision process for that over the summer? Because for a lot of the summer, it seemed like WSU was trying to get to the point where they could do a hybrid model for this semester, some in person, some online. And then in late July came the announcement that no, it would be all online for this fall semester. What factors went into that decision? Well, 
Uh, thanks. Great question. What we're seeing now is what went into that decision. Um, we were preparing and we were pretty vocal in the, in the spring term that we wanted to resume in-person uh, operations as much as practically possible for this fall. And that was what a lot of our planning was going on. Uh, however, in late July, uh, a couple of our leaders uh, sat down and they said, you know, we've been working all summer to get us here but we don't have the confidence that we can keep everybody safe and in our community in the way that we would like to through Thanksgiving. It was never, could we make it through part of September or whatever? And, and so I, I remember a meeting, I went around, we had all our deans, we had all our vice presidents, our chancellors, and I asked every single one of them, you know, their thoughts on what we should do. And this was after two months of hard work by everybody and to a person they said, I think we have to go remote. I just, we don't feel we can keep everybody safe uh, by going in person. And that was, we were going to do the same thing other universities were going to do, limit access to classrooms, have a maximum number of people that could be in there, mandate social distancing. So it wasn't that we weren't doing those things. It's just, we were really worried. And I think if we learned anything in the spring, the disruption of being, of starting in format A, which there was in person, and shifting over kind of a weekend, if you will, or spring break week to an online experience was disruptive to faculty, staff, students, the community, everybody. So we also decided if we need to make that choice, let's not do it two weeks in when everybody's moved in and we got stuff going, let's make it early. So we wanted to do that specifically to de-densify the Pullman community, uh, not have lots of students and people congregating at one place at one time on the Pullman campus. And so the reason we made that decision was to make sure that we could control and minimize the spread of COVID-19 amongst the student population. Of course, not every school has done the same. Some are in person as we've seen in around the country. And so there's, depending on where you are, heck, just across the border uh, in Idaho, in Moscow, the University of Idaho is doing this hybrid flex model, some in person, some online. So it's of course not across the board. And I've, I've heard it said, and, and there's been some reporting out there about some of the analysis of schools' decisions and, and some of it being speculated that, well, a lot of it has to do with budgets, frankly. You know, it, it costs a lot to run a school, but it costs a lot uh, in terms of budget reduction to not have people around on campus for any number of reasons. You're not having a lot of the, the same things being paid for in person. And I heard some of the analysis kind of breaking it down like this. The schools that could afford to take the budget hit, like they had a big endowment, you know, Harvard famously went online pretty early for this fall semester. They have huge endowment, so it might not hit them as hard. But schools where, you know, it's it's not as, as comfortable, you might say, in the budget picture, they really had to take that as part of the consideration, unfortunately. I just wonder if that in any way entered into the decision making for WSU. You know, uh, yes, we, we certainly looked at uh, budgetary decisions the whole time. But I would say what we wanted to do was decide what was best for our students, faculty, and staff in the community, and then assess what the budget impacts of those different decisions were. But at the end of the day, it came down to we felt that going to remote was going to be best for internally, faculty and staff, as well as the external uh, community. Um, and we are taking substantial budget reductions uh, because of not having, for example, uh, a full set of residence halls. I mean, that we're talking millions of dollars of lost revenue. Um, we're also talking about student workers. We hired tremendous number of student workers across campus. That's how partially how they help pay for their education, and we're not doing that. So it's kind of this ripple effect. But at the end of the day, if you let the financial part dictate your actions, we felt we were going to put people's health and well-being in jeopardy. So was that part of our conversation? Absolutely. Uh, that just wasn't the most prominent part of our conversation. Certainly. But uh, sticking on the budget topic, as you mentioned, there's probably going to be some lean times ahead and the full picture is yet to fully emerge. But I just wonder if you have a sense yet at this point, you know, how, how <clears throat> long term might the budget implications, the belt tightening be? Are we talking the next decade of effects? maybe just from this one year? Um, another excellent question. You know, if I could look at my crystal ball and tell, tell you that, I'd probably have a different job. Um, I would say that 
you know, the state of Washington has elected uh, not to do a special session uh, around some of the budget issues. And so, um, you know, we, we already have put in place uh, just under 40 million in cuts uh, to the institution uh, going into this next year uh, based on what we just think the projections are going to be. Um, when the legislature meets starting in January of 21, we, we expect there'll be some you know, further discussions and decisions about how the financial part's going to work. If I look at the last recession, and I, I realize the last recession and this are very different um, in, in some of the economic impacts, but if I use that as at least a data point, um, higher ed never recovered completely uh, from the cuts that we took in the last recession. We recovered a lot of it, a lot of lost ground, but we're now talking over a decade it took to sort of get back. So I, I think we're going to see some significant uh, impacts over the next two to three years. Uh, and then I suspect it'll stabilize out. And, uh, you know, the question is, is there a new normal, if you will, uh, that's out there? And as a quick example, at a lot of public universities pre that 08, 09 recession, uh, about two thirds or three quarters of their money kind of came from the state. The rest kind of came from tuition to operate. What happened is now post-recession, a decade later, those numbers are reversed. Uh, so now you get maybe 20, 25% of the money to operate from the state. The rest we generate off tuition. And so that's just been a gradual shift, but it's a substantial shift in who pays for public education in our states. So um, 10 years from now, I'll be retired and somebody else will be president, but I do suspect there'll be long-term changes to the way public higher education in Washington is funded uh, based on this pandemic and the uh, impacts of it. Well, I'm not sure if you just made a major announcement there that uh, your retirement is coming up, but uh, uh, on the topic though of budget reductions and administrators, I am curious uh, how the university vice presidents, administrators such as yourself are uh, taking on some of the impact. You've you previously talked about taking a voluntary 10% uh, cut in pay, as many CEOs and, and university heads around the country have said over the past six months that they'll do that, anticipating budget needs. Um, I, I wonder what broad things are being done at the university level to maybe, uh, I hate to say trim the fat, but maybe look at ways to cut uh, around the edges to really help that out. And I'll just note, you know, you taking a 10% pay cut is is, is all well and good. And that's, that's very nice and people probably appreciate that. But 10% of uh, a very top administrator salary is not that much compared to say a $50,000 salary, which the vast majority of employees who are not uh, tenured faculty would be making, something around that. So what, what are the university administrators doing to pitch in? Yeah, so um, you mentioned I took a salary cut as, as did some of our other highly compensated individuals, coaches, athletic director, things like that. Um, what we were able to do was uh, really control some of the budget issues this next year through not filling positions. And I'm not talking 10 or 15, I'm talking like 250, 275 open positions that will not be filled uh, this next year. Uh, at one point we felt that we might need to do some sort of a, a furlough plan across the university. And uh, due to some of the financial work we've done over the last couple of years, we just did not need to, to do a furlough plan of any type. And uh, so uh, some of our senior leadership team, uh, aside from myself and others, were also poised to participate in those same sort of uh, budgetary cuts so that it wasn't highly compensated administrative uh, folks didn't see something and our other employees did. And so at that particular point, I said, hey, if we don't need a furlough, we're not gonna have to do that this year. There is no reason for anybody to be taking salary cuts. I, I feel, still feel as president, it's important for me to set an example there. Uh, Pat Chun, our AD, same sort of thing. Our coaches, uh, our highly compensated coaches, the same thing. So several of us still felt that it was important to send a really positive message that way. Um, if we have to do anything in the future, and I'm talking about over the next several years, it will certainly be graduated. Uh, the highest paid people should take more of a cut. The, the lower paid faculty and staff that are in our organization shouldn't take anything at all. And I think that's gonna be a key characteristic moving ahead. Um, but we've gotta wait and see what's gonna happen with the state of Washington in early 21. 
uh, and then uh, we'll make decisions about what we need to, to do moving forward. Um, I would say, you know, everybody loves to point out, I'm sure you can trim fat. Um, and what happens, at least in my experience, is maybe people don't feel it this year by having those open positions. Everybody rolls up their sleeves a little bit more. They do a little bit here. They pick that up. What happens is two years from now, we see the real impact of not filling those positions where student can't get into some class they need because we don't have enough faculty. Uh, the advising takes more time or some of the services that people got used to that were fulfilled by those very staff members aren't there anymore. And so it's the long-term effects that sometimes the short term, you don't see it, but you see it in the long term. And that's my biggest concern is, you know, today students and families expect um, a different level of service than when I was a student um, in terms of support, uh, mental health, advising, all those different kind of things. And I think that's, there's no problem with that, but guess what? That's people and that's those positions that are there. And uh, we're going to have to continue to trim that workforce moving ahead if we continue to see reduced budgets. Finally, you, you've mentioned a few times the community, as in the Pullman community. And, you know, WSU, of course, is, is not the only thing going in Pullman. There's a lot of businesses, but the Pullman community, of course, is greatly affected by what happens at, uh, in Pullman at, at WSU. And so I wonder how you see your position as president in terms of supporting the broader Pullman community and what things WSU might be doing to help stem some of the, the great economic uh, issues that might be happening for business owners in Pullman, not just only this year, but going forward? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We've worked hard during my tenure as president to really build uh, really outstanding relationships with the Pullman uh, business community, uh, with our town council, uh, you know, with the Chamber of Commerce and the hospital and other types of things as being an active participant in growth and uh, wanting to work more closely together as a big employer uh, you know, if we do something, uh, we start something, it can have ripple effects on small business. And so we're really trying hard to do that. With COVID-19, uh, it's been tough, right? People are used to a large population here spending money, parents coming to visit, football weekends, things like that. So the decisions that we've already made about remote instruction and that have already had, I would say, a really challenging uh, economic impact on Pullman itself. Um, add the COVID-19 challenges and the testing and things on top of that. And there's certainly some tension now uh, with our community members and WSU about why can't you control students? You know, why are we seeing this spike? We went all summer. We had weeks that we added probably two to three positive tests in a whole week in Whitman County. Uh, now we're adding 40 or 50 a day. So there is some anger, uh, resentment, uh, feeling that if we'd had our act together or done something differently that we could have prevented this. I don't think that's the case. But on the other hand, we're going to continue to build those relationships, continue to work with the community, work with the mayor, be open and transparent and problem solve together. And that's going to be where we're going to have to do. And like Ames, Iowa and uh, Manhattan, Kansas and those college towns that are all on that New York Times list. All of us are having to do the same things in all places now. They're seeing uh, a real strong tension between the economic realities of students being there and the challenges of an 18 to 22 year old population that likes to get together and that's causing some issues with COVID-19 spread. Well, it certainly is and we will keep uh, watching how it expands in Pullman and around the Northwest. WSU President Kirk Schultz, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to be on and talk about it and uh, go kooks. You can see more on these and other stories, coronavirus news updates and resources at our website, nwpb.org. Thank you for joining us here in the Unique Northwest. Mm -hmm.